So um, our next keynote is um, my Wolfgang Fultner from um, Infineon. He, uh, um, he works there as a system architect for embedded computing. Um, and he um, holds the position uh, of a distinguished engineer for system architecture. And his area of work um, looks at uh, embedded architectures for artificial intelligence and machine learning and specifically focusing uh, on edge computing and working with smart sensors. So in, in that context, he will talk to us today um, about uh, TinyML going beyond um, audio and vision. Um, and as in the, in the talk before, please don't hesitate to type any of your questions in the Q&A box so um, Wolfgang can deal with them at the end of his talk. Yes, <clears throat> so thanks a lot. Welcome everybody to my talk uh, on tiny ML beyond audio and vision. And uh, since I was introduced already, let's just jump to uh, an overview about my talk. Uh, it actually comes in three sections. Um, in this presentation, I will talk about embedded machine learning for sensors other than microphones and cameras. I will introduce uh, those sensors and highlight a few embedded applications that are using uh, machine learning. Uh, finally, I'll describe my vision, the Infineon vision about the future of tiny uh, ML and how we are addressing that. So I can actually, between the sessions, uh, it makes sense to, to answer some, some, some questions. Um, let me first start um, with something relatively wild and, and untamed thinking uh, about sensors and embedded ML. I, I promise I'll get back to some more down to earth stuff later and uh, give you uh, even something in the end that you can download and try and uh, try out yourself at home. So the time when the main application, the times when the main application for embedded AI was keyword detection with a microphone are, are over. And also visual wake words have been exhausted uh, quite a bit already. Today, there is a lot of emerging applications uh, with embedded AL with more exotic sensors. I just was reminded that this is actually already within products today. Uh, when I bought myself a new fitness tracker, actually, I, I, after the long winter and a lot of home office, I decided I need to do some more sports. And so being a technical geek, I bought myself a brand new fitness tracker to motivate me to do it. Um, so on the picture on the left side, you, you, you see me, actually, this should be proof that I do some sports every now and then, travel biking, for example, which is my favorite hobby. And on the right side, uh, you see the, the new gadget that I bought. Uh, these bracelet trackers are interesting because they use a technique called uh, photoplethysmography uh, to sense your heart rate. They shine LED light on your skin to make uh, your capillary, capillary veins visible in your wrist and an optical sensor then measures how fast your blood is pumping. With such a setup, you can also measure a blood oxygen concentration. Um, since this wristband is not always properly attached you, uh, you need something to sort out uh, bad measurements and uh, machine learning is a good, good way of doing this. Um, and if you combine uh, this uh, with a motion sensor, uh, then you can also detect very reliably um, uh, activities such as uh, sleeping or walking or running. So you can classify that. And this fitness tracker also has a sort of a motion weight word so if you turn uh, the arm wrist, it switches on the GUI, uh, which saves a lot of power and makes the battery last for a couple of days. Well, this is what exists today, but what will happen with uh, fitness and health monitoring in the future? And this is where the, the more uh, untamed thinking begins. <laughs> so, um, Luckily, science fiction authors have thought about this already. 
If you're old enough, you might even remember the movie Fantastic Voyage. This is from the 60s, 1960s. Um, this is about a fantastic Jules Verne-like journey in a miniaturized submarine um, into the blood circulation of uh, an injured scientist. The crew has to navigate through the body, body and ultimately do even some brain surgery. Uh, imagine we had that technology, what could be possible with that? I actually took the freedom to modify the movie poster slightly to make it reflect the, the current situation a little more uh, closely. But how will these fitness um, and health trackers really look in, in the future? Um, and here it is, I've architected one for you. Certainly it's more realistic to not plan this uh, to be a manned mission, um, but it might still be a highly autonomous uh, microsubmarine maneuvering in your blood vessels. Certainly there has to be a system for energy, so harvesting, storage and, and propulsion. Um, there, has, there will be some, as a basis, there will be some very similar sensors down here uh, like in my fitness tracker as a basis. Uh, but the difference will be that all measurements are taken inside your body. So blood pressure can be directly sensed. And also multiple sensors can be available uh, across your body. So for example, accelerometers, multiple accelerometers, um, in multiples of these, uh, these uh, submarines can um, detect anomalies in your movements. There can be additional chemical sensors and biological sensors, chemical sensors for uh, blood parameters like glucose, cholesterol, lipids, um, and also biological sensors that can potentially then detect uh, infections, e.g. malicious viruses. Um, there will have to be, of course, some very low power, or most likely a uh, neuromorphic brain the, this is required for autonomous uh, smart action and the sophisticated power management and also as part of the swarm intelligence of multiple of those sensors um, they need to be coordinated and ultimately the intelligence may, might also decide for disposal of, 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 of the tracker itself at end of life. For those who think this is far out there is companies today that are integrating similar functionality on uh, small patches for a skin. And as a matter of fact, very recently, there was also an implant implantable blood, blood oxygen sensor uh, announced. But the question is how long will this take? So when will we have this, uh, this uh, concentration of very tiny sensors and very tiny ML? So of course, this is uh, wild guesswork, but nevertheless, We already experienced uh, this uh, high level of integration evolving over a short amount of time. Actually, we, we experienced this with computers. And uh, I took this as a reference for my own fun. And uh, this is now not a very scientific study, nevertheless, uh, I think interesting. Um, I took uh, actually computers that I have in my home. My, my oldest computer is this here. And it's a PDP 1123, and its brain is uh, relatively compact already. It's uh, 3 million uh, cubic millimeters in size. Uh, it was built uh, in 79, and it has a Mac performance, which is the uh, trade unit for uh, neural uh, computing performance these days um, of 30 key, uh, 30 kilo, kilo megs per second. So, um, it took me quite a while to figure out in the old manuals, by the way. And um, then there I took a more modern computer, uh, which is uh, a mod also a module. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a, an easy Bluetooth LE module that comes uh, Bluetooth low energy module. So it already has a wireless edit now. So some, some, some step to further integration. Uh, which only has a volume of 500 cubic millimeters. And um, 
it has uh, roughly, uh, it can do two uh, max per cycle, per drop cycle. So we end up at two mega max. And uh, then I, I, I computed the, uh, the, the uh, um, some, some normalized uh, performance per volume. Uh, so uh, max per second per cubic millimeter. And so you, of course you see that there is a vast difference between the two. Uh, so a lot of evolution over 40 years. And actually I'm, what, what, I, what, what, what it comes down to is that the, 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 the normalized performance, make performance doubles every 1.5 year, every 1.5 years, very nice surprise. And now you can extrapolate this uh, in the future if you want. Uh, so for example, assume you want an ADAS-like uh, compute performance in this, in this health tracker. So, so like in a car today, so with a hundred uh, tera uh, max in a, a tens of a cubic millimeter. Um, of course, you still need to integrate the sensors and the energy system. Um, so you can do the extrapolation yourself. In my own computation, I ended up in 2040. So you're reminded, uh, you're, you're, you're invited to remind me um, then about my prediction. So, but to be fair, I mean, this is mostly about computing only. So this does not really take into account that uh, actuators and, and sensors need to be integrated as well. However, there are striking examples for integration of, sensor, of sensors or miniaturization of sensors. I know I didn't wanna talk about audio too much, but actually microphones are a good example of uh, miniaturization. Um, a lot has happened from the early days of, of microphones, like depicted here on the left side. Now you find numerous of these tiny little uh, silicon microphones um, in your smartphones and voice assistants. So it's a picture on the right side. Um, in all these audio gadgets, there are multiple of these silicon microphones and they deliver high quality audio which allows uh, beamforming uh, to capture the audio of interest. Uh, advances in MEMS technology have made this possible. MEMS stands for microelectronic, microelectronic mechanical systems. And it leverages uh, semiconductor manufacturing technology to integrate mechanic, mechanical and electrical components. At Infineon, we are researching, developing, and mass producing multiple miniaturized sensors. This picture illustrates our ambition to mimic and exceed human sensing capabilities. I mean, I've I mentioned already the microphones for the sense of hearing. Um, we also work in radar technology, which is, you can think of it as an augmentation of the sense of touch and sight. Um, we do have uh, pressure sensors, magnetic sensors, uh, electric field sensors, uh, which are uh, um, related to the human sense of touch. Um, but there is also a miniaturized uh, gas sensors, uh, which ultimately uh, will result in a more complex uh, sense of smell. And there is a more specific uh, visual sensors uh, that can, uh, like time of flight, that give uh, a distance to the sense of vision. A common challenge for all these uh, new sensors, uh, as I want to call them, is um, in particular now with machine learning, uh, obtaining training data, having training data. Uh, most publicly available sensor data is for audio and vision, for audio, and vision uh, data formats are largely standardized um, and machine learning is applied since a couple of years. So this bar graph actually is uh, generated from, from, from Kaggle.com and um, it shows the, the different uh, data sets, the number of data sets available for 
for different sensors. Um, it's dominated by uh, data obtained from cameras and, and microphones. And it becomes very sparse uh, for, for, for other sensors. This is also partially due to the lack of exchange standards. Uh, and this, this limits also the advantage, advances in machine learning here. Um, the data generated by the sensors uh, that I am talking about are also sometimes uh, very difficult to handle because they are configuration dependent, like uh, antenna configuration of a radar sensor influences the, the radar raw data quite drastically. And if you think about liquid and gas sensors, <clears throat> then there is um, uh, a lot of those uh, methods to, to, to do that sensing always resulting in, in different, uh, different uh, data properties. Um, and finally, companies are not always very open with this data, with this data, because they might also it might also reveal some technological secrets. At Infineon, we're actively working on uh, training data generation. You will also see later in the talk, and partnering with companies in this field. So this now is the first part of the talk, and we're now diving into. Uh, into new applications with these miniaturized sensors and how they are implemented in the guided systems. If there is one or two questions, it would be okay for now. By the way, can you can you hear me better now? Yeah, it's fine. It's fine, Wolfgang. Yeah, it, it's, it's better. Yeah. Uh, there is one question from. Um, one of the other speakers for today that was asking like Microsoft Marine um, health monitors seem very futuristic. And the question was how many years you expect this type of technology to get to some level of maturity and miniaturization? Well, maybe I mentioned it too, too quickly in the, yeah. in the presentation, but I actually gave a date. And um, if, you, if, you switch, if we switch back to this slide here, I mean, this is of course my, yeah. my health very wild, very wild extrapolation for the question mark up here. It was 2040. Yeah, 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 indeed, yeah. Very good. So it is still some time, some time out, but uh, okay. So let's continue now um, with applications uh, and implementations of these sensors with TinyML. So let's first start with a relatively simple sensor, which is uh, barometric pressure sensors. They have become pretty accurate these days. Uh, with such a sensor, you can resolve uh, two centimeters of, of relative height difference, or height difference actually. So if you, you can measure the height of a person by placing the sensor first on the floor and then on the head of the person, and uh, the, the pressure difference will, will be able to tell you the height in two, cent with two, two centimeters accuracy. But you can of course also use this to, um, to sense vertical movement. And uh, this can improve the, the classification of, uh, um, of, of motion patterns. So it allows you to like sitting, standing, walking, running, um, and it can even, uh, you can even use this to count stairs. Like here you see this, the stair pattern of, of the person climbing in, in the pressure differences. Uh, but we've used it uh, also for something different, uh, which is uh, um, patterns in, in actually um, subsonic space. So we've used it for, um, for window breaking uh, detection Existing, there is glass breaking detection in alarm systems that is based on audio. But in a household, uh, there's more glasses that can break. And if you know children, then it's not always, if a glass is breaking, it's not always the window that is smashed, hopefully. Um, so we used our pressure sensor and we, we, we characterize, we, 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 we built a, a classification for for uh, pressure events in, in air pressure. 
Um, and with this, uh, in the sense of fusion with the audio uh, classification of the same events, we could uh, drastically reduce the false positive and false negative results. And we, we have a demonstrator that is actually uh, can be ordered. Uh, and, and that is, uh, it's still a, it's a Cortex-M4 system, still quite some memory, which is only partially used, but uh, uh, it's also an earlier uh, experiment that we did. So it's not entirely optimized yet. So it's still running on floating point uh, and so on. Um, let me briefly come back to the data gathering aspect. <clears throat> For audio, you can get uh, glass break uh, uh, recordings online. You can, can buy them, but for pressure, you cannot purchase this. Uh, so we had to, 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 um, to um, get uh, obtain the data ourselves uh, with destructive experiments, as you can see here. And uh, it, it um, took us a number of uh, windows that we, that we had to smash. And uh, even with clever um, synthetic data augmentation, this becomes expensive after a while. For Infineon, another important uh, field of sensing is radar technology. Um, radar measures the distance of objects uh, by the time elapsed between transmitting a radar signal and re receiving its reflection. Um, in a FMCW radar, for example, you, the transmitted signal consists of small ramps uh, with, of, of, of linear frequency sweeps uh, with a certain bandwidth. And with this uh, and clever processing, you can uh, actually map um, close, uh, close objects to lower frequency and distance objects to higher frequencies. And then velocity becomes also visible by, by, by actually change of distance. And so with a 2D uh, Fourier transform here at the beginning uh, and some, some moving, tar moving target uh, indications, so you, you, you only look at the moving targets, you can produce uh, what's called a, a range Doppler map uh, that also de depicts the, 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 the strength of reflection at a certain distance and with a certain uh, velocity. And, and this is very characteristic patterns for, for, for objects. And uh, so you can take these range Doppler maps and uh, you can even add a sense of direction by uh, with multiple, multiple antennas. Uh, so you have more range Doppler maps. Um, and, uh, but with all this information, you can differentiate objects. Um, you can classify them basically based on size, velocity profile and reflection properties. Uh, radar can be used in cases where video is not ap applicable because of privacy concerns, for example. So this um, is an example of an application that has already shown, been shown in a talk on Monday of one of my colleagues. This is with the 60 gigahertz radar sensor, a gesture sensing example that is uh, classifying uh, three gestures uh, left swipe and uh, right swipe and finger waving. And it also is trained to be uh, robust against uh, unknown gestures. Um, so this is, for example, interesting for, 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 for vending machines that you want to operate touchlessly. And this, the, the big thing here is just a, it's just a power brick. So it's not, a, it's, a, it's, it's just for the power supply of, of the demonstrator. And um, we've uh, first done an unconstrained implementation of this on a PC, just as a proof of concept, uh, where still the whole pre-processing uh, and, and, and the, uh, the neural processing on TensorFlow was taking uh, one gigabyte of memory footprint. So that was just the first step. Then we've done this, uh, the standalone implementation in, shown in the previous slide, 
on a, on a form factor PCB. You see it's magnified here. And uh, the, the radar sensor is actually just a little piggyback here. And um, so this uh, was then fitting into a much smaller RAM footprint, which is just uh, 288 kilobytes, including the pre-processing on a, on a M4, Cortex M4 processor with 150 megahertz. We could also use, um, so we did do 8-bit quantization and also some uh, structural improvements to the neural networks here. Um, and we could also take uh, advantage of the, the SIMD make instructions that this processor has. Let me quickly come back to the, the data gathering aspect again. Um, this is, for example, um, a mobile setup that we are using also and also sharing with partners um, for radar data capture. It contains a, a 3D camera and, 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 and the radar sensor and some uh, mechanical fixtures. And here you can record, uh, sorry, the, the radar data and the, uh, the camera data uh, synchronously. And for, for some um, uh, classification tasks, there is already uh, video uh, or for, for vision, there is already classification networks like detecting persons and their movements. So you can use this to label the radar data in a um, fully or semi-automated way. And um, let me now show you another nice uh, small example with the magnetic field sensors. Uh, magnetic field sensors, um, they are measuring the strengths of the B field in X, Y, and Z directions. So all directions of space. Um, and this can be, for example, used to detect the motion of a, of a sensor, so rotations, complex 3D movements, or just uh, translations uh, can, can be sensed by the change of, of, of magnetic field. And uh, this is, for example, used in, in uh, state-of-the-art uh, joysticks. And typically, there is uh, two, two pairs of magnet plus sensor. So uh, there is one, uh, there is one uh, down here for the tilt in X and Y direction. And there is another magnet plus sensor for sensing the rotation. And we've now been able with um, machine learning to, um, uh, to um, reduce this to just one magnet plus uh, two sensors. Um, this is in particular became possible because the field geometry here is, uh, is a little more complex and uh, because you're not uh, placing the sensors along the axis. And you can handle this very easily uh, with a machine learned algorithm and um, with a simulation that generates training data for it. So we've actually done a Python simulation that generates the training data. And uh, then we've trained uh, two neural networks to, to compute uh, the, the tilts and rotation. And uh, this comes with the side benefit of uh, having all the computation now in, in, in 16 format, whereas usually it would have been complex floating point uh, com uh, um, um, computations otherwise. And this now gives a lot of more flexibility for the mechanical design of the joystick. This is some more detail on the, on the actual implementation uh, of, of the neural network. So there is uh, one feed forward neural network for X and Y tilt. And there is another feed forward neural network for the angle, rotation angle computation. Um, uh, each of these networks has uh, 637 trainable parameters. And um, we used uh, for the training, we used uh, actually uh, um, networks, uh, deep learning toolbox 
Uh, we're deliberately trying different uh, neural network frameworks for uh, gaining experience and for comparison. And we also use the associated code generator for generating the int 16 code. And, and that all fits now into a small cortex and zero based MCU uh, with only 19 kilobytes of code and uh, 23 milliseconds of, uh, of latency. Previously, it was a larger CPU. Finally, let me point out uh, um, our use of embedded ML for environmental sensing. Um, also there, there was a talk already on Monday, uh, but um, let me also quickly come back. So the talk, if you wanna see more details about this is titled Tiny ML Design for Environmental Sensing Applications. But in a nutshell, uh, we've integrated um, um, a small PSOC M0 based processor together with a MEMS uh, gas sensor, an adsorption based sensor in a small package, it's actually six by six millimeter. And uh, so the, the resources, memory resources are just 4K byte uh, of SRAM and 32 kilobyte of, of flash. And with this, this gas sensors have uh, some relatively complex behavior, also temporal behavior um, and cross talk and non-linearities, all sorts of effects that can be handled very well with machine learning and uh, with uh, the, the small intelligence next to the sensor, we can actually uh, compute uh, gas concentrations in PPP or PPM and uh, and output them via the I2C or SPI interface. So this is used in applications uh, like indoor and outdoor air quality sensing. So this was now the section about uh, some of sensors and their uh, embedded ML applications. If there is another question, I'm open to take it. Yes, there's, there's a few questions. Um, there's one from Christian Tanase, if I pronounce that correctly. It's about considering that a large amount of public data sets for sensors like pressure or gases uh, that are out there, would it help um, speed up building more diverse applications with tiny ML? And what effect would sensor characteristics have on these kind of data and models? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, of course, more data sets would, would, would speed up, uh, I think, adoptions. Or even um, also, I mean, sometimes it's, it's very sensor specific or it's even application specific, uh, the, the type of data you want. So like in the radar, we've, we've even built a, a data recording kit to, so that you can build, build your own applications. Um, but you have to be also careful, even with like this Kaggle uh, study that I did, if you look closer uh, and if you, if you, for example, search for gas, uh, a lot of this is not sensor raw data. This is already pre-processed data and so on. Mm. And for some of the sensor, it's really like for pressure, for example, you can standardize that data. You can, that you can still like audio because it's subsonic, but for other sensors like gas and, uh, and radar, the sensor itself has a lot of influence on the raw data and it's very hard. There, there needs to be some development of standard exchange formats, some standardization. Yeah. All right, interesting. Another question was from Chun Lei Shu. Um, it's for the hand gesture recognition compared with um, vision-based recognition using ConfNets to learn the features from the images. What are the features you can get from radar signals when you want to classify? Um, the, um, um, from radar that you get, uh, I mean, in addition to the, the, the vision, you get really velocities, you get velocity patterns. And also radar can, uh, I mean, radar does not really record anything. So there's a privacy uh, advantage and also a power advantage, by the way. Yeah. So there is a lot less processing associated and the sensor itself runs on, on really milli milliwatts. All right, and in the meantime, quite a few other questions came in. There's one asking for a part number, but I'll let you answer that after the talk. Uh, yeah. Then um, 
There are just questions from Andrea Gallo asking, are you running TinyML with any RTOS or on BSOC um, without any RTOS? And in, in that case, which real-time OS are you using? We, 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 we do both. Uh, for mm -hmm. RTOS, it's uh, free, free RTOS. But we have the, the applications that I've shown so far, they were all bare metal applications. Okay. Yeah. Actually, in the last uh, case, the gas sensor, the only option was bare metal because it's just very small memory resources and we could not even afford a machine learning runtime system. So like a TensorFlow Micro would have been far too big to fit into the, the yeah. processor. All right, understood. And uh, maybe one more, two more questions. You mentioned RNNs in, uh, in a PSOC. R are PSOC supporting TinyML is the question. So maybe uh, that's a good question. introduction to the last part of my talk. Ah. This is now, I've been talking a lot about sensors now, futuristic sensors, really yeah. existing sensors. The last part is about the other stuff. It's about the processing, it's about the security and it's about the ecosystem. All right, thank you. And I have, think I have uh, one more maybe before we move on. There was also one um, asked by, um, um, by Ajar in uh, one of the panelists for later tonight, what neural network architecture did you use for the gesture recognition application and are there specific optimization techniques you used for that? Um, we are, um, may, let me maybe ask, answer this a bit general. We typically for the, for the radar uh, sensing, we started a lot with, uh, we started typically with vision-based uh, architectures and uh, like, mobile net inspired architectures. And then we've cut it down this, uh, in the, in the, well, first input tensor is typically smaller. Uh, you just, you can, you can actually to range Doppler maps, you can apply a vision, uh, vision uh, uh, classification. Uh, you've seen the range Doppler maps really is, it's a black and white image. It's a smaller image. It's just black and white. So you don't need RGB. So you can tailor this down. You can reduce the number of layers uh, but we're using pretty much standard convolution uh, and, and value activations, pooling and, 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 and this uh, type of things. So. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, if there's more questions, let them um, come in. And in, in light of the time, I would probably move ahead. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure, go ahead and then we'll uh, see. I think, I think uh, 6 p.m. is the hard, the hard limit. It's okay. It's interesting that there's a conversation, lots of questions, so uh, yeah. no worries. Good. So now after looking into the sensors, as promised, uh, um, let me talk about some, some, some things around uh, the sensors that uh, have to evolve to enable TinyML. Um, so let's first... Uh, um, look at this chart. So what does it take uh, now to unlock the value of edge AI or embedded AI, or as you may call it, or edge of the edge uh, AI actually? Um, so I have said uh, already, um, so there needs to be these sensors and along with them, the, uh, the training data, or at least the means to generate this training data. But we also need uh, appropriate processing that uh, matches uh, the, the requirements. Uh, and um, so there is a certain confluence of increasing um, uh, performance uh, with uh, improving machine learning acceleration in these embedded environments and also reduced software footprint by even more efficient uh, uh, network architectures, for example. But to really get this going, uh, I think also security is an aspect to look at. And uh, of course, uh, the, the ecosystem around uh, those uh, sensors and processors needs, uh, needs to be looked at. And let me start with the processing. So processing, what, what we've do, we're doing a lot uh, so far in, in, in today's applications is we're using uh, embedded edge AI applications. We are using uh, CPUs, MCUs, and um, there you get a certain performance. You're implementing the AI in, in, in software mostly, uh, but you can actually extend the CPUs just with small 
additional instructions, vector, vector instructions that are particularly suited to accelerate machine learning. So this is within the TPU. Um, as a next step, you can also uh, spend even more uh, uh, on specific acceleration with uh, adding a signal processor uh, or uh, an embedded CPU to your, to your uh, GPU, to your CPU. Uh, this will give you another boost of performance. And ultimately you can design uh, embedded neural processing units. So just coming in your normal application processor that are um, that are that are uh, tuned for ML performance, and um, we've observed that uh, I mean all these architectures have uh, have good uh, reasons to use them, but uh, there is roughly as a rule of thumb a factor of 10x in performance increase between them. So uh, in total, there is between a CPU only and and introducing the the neural processing unit on the same process node, um, there is a, a factor of thousands in terms of performance gain. Of course, you can use the performance gain to reduce the power because if your um, network is already executed once, then you can switch off the accelerator unit and save power. Um, to illustrate that point, let me show you this chart. Uh, we are regularly doing some benchmarking, of course, um, and uh, this is now a benchmark um, where M4, a Cortex M4 processor, such as the one on our um, Cypress PSOC 6 is taken as a reference. So it's 100% performance. And uh, there is a, a mobile net V1, a full size, quantized to 8 bits is taken as a as a, a benchmark case. And we've normalized the clock rate for, for, for all the processor cores that we look at to 250, 50 megahertz. And they're also looking to, to ARM processor cores. Uh, and uh, we are also benchmarking other uh, cores and, and accelerators, uh, but this is nice because it's a, it's a comparison within one product line. And um, so this is uh, the measurements we've taken at Infineon. Uh, looking at the M7, um, you get uh, compared to the M4 for the same machine learning load, you get only relatively little acceleration because I mean, it, there is not too many more things you can use. It's your basically, your performance is determined by the, by the, 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 the speed of the SIMD uh, MAC instructions. And, um, but now looking at the latest uh, incarnation of Cortex-M cores, which is the M55, you already see uh, there is a roughly six, six times improvement in performance over uh, M4. Uh, and this is because this has uh, vector extensions inside the CPU, the so-called helium extensions. And uh, this gives you quite a big boost already. But then there is also dedicated uh, neural processing accelerators. And here you see there is a, a, a big step uh, in uh, reduction of execution time of latency. And um, for, the, for the largest embed, uh, variant of embedded MPU, you're almost seeing this factor of thousand of acceleration for the same load. And uh, this also results in a frame rate that is, uh, of course, much, much higher. So looking at this upcoming uh, uh, processing capabilities from various sites, uh, um, there is, there, you might today, you, you might not want to run a mobile net on, a, on an M4 processor, I agree, but, um, this performed, but, but with um, upcoming MCU generations and with these uh, accelerators, uh, acceleration possibilities added to the CPU in a, in a tiny little embedded environment. Um, at first, you can take, you can uh, use it for the existing applications um, to boost the user experience. Um, but you can also use it, uh, or you can use it to reduce power consumption uh, for existing applications, for example. 
but you can also use it for um, a lot of new applications. So uh, starting, for example, with the audio wake word detection, uh, keyword detection, you can take this within the embedded environment all the way to, to natural language processing. For our radar cases, you can also, I mean, there is an equivalent also in radar for wake words, which is an, or, or, or a simple gesture sensing as we've seen with just three gestures. You can take this to, uh, with multiple antennas, uh, multiple transmit and receive antennas. You can take this to tracking of multiple objects in an indoor or outdoor um, in environment. And for vision, these additional acceleration capabilities um, will allow you to have higher resolutions and, and higher uh, frame ra rates. And the good thing is this next generation of MCUs uh, will come at a reasonable or relatively modest uh, increase of price. So um, dramatic power inc performance increase for machine learning applications, but uh, but uh, modest increase uh, of, of price. Let me uh, not forget to uh, look at the security aspect. Um, it's often neglected, becomes even more relevant with Edge AI, uh, speeding up the digitalization of nearly everything. And uh, in security, you, you do some threat modeling. And in, in, in this case, the main threats are um, for edge devices is fake or for, for, for an edge system that is uh, fake devices. And uh, this can be protected by having securely stored uh, unique device identities. Then uh, there is data poisoning uh, as a threat where you have uh, secure uh, communication protocols with uh, credentials stored in secure memory. Then you have to protect against malware injection. So there are uh, cryptographically secured uh, firmware um, update protocols and uh, the, 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 the neural network uh, is part of a firmware update typically. And um, you also want to protect against uh, IP loss. And this is done with uh, encrypted storage uh, on chip and also a secure boot process uh, with a root of trust. This protection measures uh, assure integrity of the edge device. And um, this way, they, it's, it's also that you're uh, securing the trustworthiness of your big data in the cloud. Um, but embedded machine learning itself can also be used to enhance security. So there is, um, sometimes the possibility to do user authentication, like fingerprint uh, sensing, uh, which is embedded in chip cards these days. Uh, and you can also use a secure uh, process in the background that is monitoring what's going on in your MCU and, and does anomaly detection uh, to um, um, detect uh, intrusions into your system. So security, so we've talked about processing security, now about uh, the ecosystem. So um, what shall this ecosystem uh, comprise? I think there needs to be um, some cloud-based uh, training infrastructure that supports uh, a choice of uh, uh, neural network frameworks. Um, some of the users just want to download pre-trained models and uh, do transfer learning for their specific use case. Other users might aim for uh, extensive hyperparameter search for their own uh, network architecture. The neural network mapping tools have to support multiple hardware targets and allow flexible partitioning of the processing load over multi-core architectures that become more and more popular. Um, the machine learning workload has to integrate seamlessly into the embedded software architecture, consisting of RTOS, um, secure concept, and uh, human machine interface, and a wired and wireless stack. And uh, to become more concrete, what, what we are doing here, um, 
Infineon is just uh, just these days actually announced two weeks ago um, the release of the Modus Toolbox ML. And uh, some of you may know Modus Toolbox already from uh, the PSOC uh, MCUs. And this is now the machine learning extension for it. The Modus Toolbox ML is an interactive tool for optimizing and validating neural networks in the embedded environment. It supports, so it's this part up here. It supports uh, uh, neural network, uh, standard neural network uh, data formats. It supports uh, a number of layer types like uh, MLP, GRU, and convolution layers. And support is further growing. There it supports uh, all common uh, activation functions like radio, sigmoid, tangents H, softmax, and linear. And it supports quantization uh, either to uh, leaving it so it will be float in the embedded environment or to 16 and 8 bit uh, weight and feature quantization. Um, if you, you can try this out, actually, with, uh, and I would recommend the PSOC 64 kit for that together with a, a sensor shield. And uh, the, the sensor shield contains uh, the pressure sensor. It also contains uh, microphones, and it also contains a uh, nine axis orientation sensor. And uh, there is uh, also some software support for cloud connectivity uh, via MQTT, which is a secure message, message transport uh, protocol. And uh, this is now a glimpse into the, the tool itself, uh, into the Modus Toolbox ML configurator tool and how it works. So here you're um, defining a prefix for all the generated um, files and an output folder for all the generated files. Here you enter the name of your pre-trained model or your, so your source file and, and the framework it comes from. And then if you press generate source, it gives you a, um, it implements actually um, in all um, available uh, quantization uh, levels and gives you memory footprint uh, and uh, also um, uh, the cycle time, execution time for the different uh, quantization variants. And it gives you uh, uh, some, some report on, on the tool operation. And uh, then you can use uh, the validate uh, button and that takes you to another screen um, there you can read in some validation data or you can generate it randomly and you can choose for which uh, quantization levels to, to validate. And then it will give you some uh, uh, tabular um, listing of absolute er maximum absolute errors, um, but it will also give you some graphical representation of that. And um, also it will give you some uh, test results uh, textually. And um, this is now just a, a list of resources uh, that you might find interesting. This is what I announced in the beginning, what can be downloaded uh, and tried out. Of course, for trying out, you need the hardware kits, but uh, this is freely available on GitHub. And actually, on the, here on the Git repository, you'll find uh, a magic wand example for, for download, for example. Um, and this is now my last slide to conclude. Um, so there is uh, uh, numerous sensors uh, beyond uh, quite simple ones, complex ones, beyond audio and vision that are also benefiting from TinyML for these new sensors to be enabled. At first, we need uh, availability of good quality training data. Then we need optimized network architectures for these specific uh, sensors. And we need uh, the right level of hardware acceleration, right trade-off of performance and power. And they also need to be integrated in an ecosystem of tools and embedded re reference designs to get started quickly. This is now concluding my talk and I'm open for final questions. 
Thank you very much, uh, Wolfgang. I see for now, I see two questions. One of them, I think it uh, is a carryover from the previous section, but was about how can we leverage sensors on a mobile phone? If, if you could provide an example or a use case of that, that would be interesting. Um, I mean, there is, uh, uh, there is uh, on a mobile phone, this one example is, I mean, there's typically accelerate meters in mobile phones, there's microphones in there, and there is a lot of hidden ML already in, in, in state-of-the-art mobile phones. So there, there actually is the, the, the keyword detections are, they're not running on the application processor. They are, are already in a much lower power domain, MCU-like domain. But you can also, for example, do fitness tracking on the mobile phone by, by, do, by looking at the motion patterns and, and detect classifying them. So, yeah. and, and also, I mean, we will have mobile phones where you will have gas sensing integrated and so on. And, and all of this will, will benefit from, from embedded ML. Yeah. All right. There's um, one more is a question from one of the other panelists is like um, in, in the MTB ML tool, what, what kind of operations are supported there? And is, is there a way to customize those? Um, there is, uh, there, there is um, um, typically uh, there is, a re there is for, in, in terms of layer types, there's convolutions are supported, uh, multi-layer perceptrons and uh, GRUs as one example of RNA. Mm -hmm. um, and there is um, a number of um, 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 activation functions, standard activation functions, ReLU, Tangens H, Sigmoid, there is um, a few more things, but it, this was just the first release. So this is also growing. Uh, and I mean, just check it out. We will be growing the, the, the supported number. Of, I mean, you have to write kernels, of course, for everything. Yeah, yeah. Start number. Uh, but this will be a grow, growing a number of functions supported and also uh, a growing number of examples in the Git repository. Excellent, thank you. And then final question. Is, um, is there, can you comment on the use of NB IoT connectivity uh, for, for connectivity in remote areas? Um, um, well, that's, I think it's important. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> certainly we are also thinking about that. I mean, we, are, we, we do have uh, wireless connectivity uh, options like you've seen in the tiny little module, which is a Bluetooth LE module. In the beginning, there's also wireless uh, stuff, but also uh, um, 5G connectivity or narrowband connectivity will become important, yes, for, for edge, of course. All right. Thank you. Oh, I was about to say that's the last one, but some, a new one just arrived. Is um, One is, uh, this is from Hector Medina. How do you foresee the use of this uh, presented technology to solve important problems related to VOC sensors that discretize each distinct gas while lowering the cost of the current tech, which is maybe a very in-depth gas. Pretty sequence. much in depth. So, uh, but I mean, we're, we're working on various um, uh, gas sensing, also VOC is a topic, of course, and uh, absorption-based sensors are certainly a key technology to be used there that allows you to sense multiple gases simultaneously. But you do have that problem of cross sensitivity of those sensors and, and also relatively sometimes very strange behavior. And their ML helps you quite a lot. Also drift behavior is very critical for gas yeah. sensors. All right, thank you very much. And that, with that, I think then we can uh, close this keynote. Thank you very much, Wolfgang, for your very interesting presentation and for your time to also answer all the questions that we got. Yeah, feel free to post more questions uh, to my email. All right, thank you. Of course, uh, I do want to thank all our sponsors. So the premier sponsor, um, Newton, um, with their automated uh, tiny ML solutions, um, executive sponsors, ARM, and uh, we've organized also a very nice panel that we witnessed just now. Um, Edge Impulse as well, um, Yano was there and we presented some of their work just now as well. Um, then also Qualcomm um, working on advancing AI research to make efficient AI ubiquitous. 
um, sentient, um, working on chip solutions to do ultra low power, high performance, deep neural network processors. Um, then our platinum sponsors, Infineon, we've had a keynote uh, from Wolfgang from Infineon earlier today. Uh, Reality AI, um, working on advanced sensing with uh, Edge AI and TinyML. Then our gold sponsors, Latent AI, working on adaptive AI for the intelligent edge. SenseML, building smart um, IoT sensor devices from data. And then um, our silver sponsors, EMSA, um, where Elat also presented today, what they are up to, Green Waves Technologies, HOTG, ImagiMop, Kiso, Seed, and ST. And with that, that's uh, the wrap for today. Thank you everyone for your attention and your attendance.